All right, gang. Welcome. <coughs> two, antenna, two antennas here. Yeah, two antennas here. Good morning. Um, I'm Tim. That's Matt. Uh, just want to say thank you, by the way, to uh, uh, Nanog for hosting us. And, and uh, I know that Matt wanted to say thanks because uh, this has nothing to do with his current business, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah thanks to my employer that's watching the stream. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not talking about work. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I um, want to talk to you a little bit about uh, long-distance wireless deployments, and particularly into remote areas like the Fairline Islands. Um, we were asked when I first submitted this, they wanted to know a little bit about the troubles and how we planned it and things like that. So we're going to go into some details. Uh, perhaps if uh, Nanog wants to do something a little bit more detailed, like uh, uh, a Sunday morning session on how to do this kind of stuff, we can do that. But uh, this is going to be really abbreviated. So. Uh, pardon me for sort of rushing through some of the details on this. So anyway, um, uh, the Farallons, let's see, how do we go forward? I guess we just click. Oh, no? Click that. Great. So you want to talk about Yeah, yeah, we're going <laughs> to try to split it up so we don't have to share too many microphones here. So uh, uh, Tim and I have been building networks in pretty crazy places for a while. Uh, I've, I've done some network deployments in Bhutan, Burning Man, other crazy places. So we're sort of used to doing um, uh, strange deployments. What was interesting about this one is there's a lot of stakeholders involved because the island is actually uh, technically managed by fish and wildlife. There's a lot of third parties involved. Uh, it's much more... Uh, difficult than typically just going across the street and dealing with a lack, that sort of thing. So where exactly are the, uh, the Farallons? Uh, these are basically um, about 50 kilometers or, or 30 miles or about, uh, if you're not into the metric system, outside of the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, San Francisco. And they're technically officially part of the city of San Francisco and the county. And they're only accessible by boat or helicopter. Uh, travel time is anywhere from 30 minutes to five hours, depending on your, your method of transportation. And it's just right before the continental shelf uh, ends, uh, you know, effectively where the water dips down to you know, thousands of feet. The, uh, the islands are interesting because they sustain uh, a fairly large uh, bird breeding colony, um, one of the largest south of Alaska, and apparently it contains 30% of uh, California's nesting seabirds. Uh, there's a number of species there, so it's, it's definitely a very active site. What's really interesting is actually getting uh, to the site. It's, it's extremely limited uh, and a privilege to be invited there. Uh, it's it's kind of like a wilderness exercise in many uh, senses. Access is physically limited. There's no pier. There's no dock. There's no beach. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real process to get on there. So the first step is taking a boat to get out there. This is generally around... 4 a.m. You get there around 6 or 7 a.m. Uh, you then get on a small uh, zodiac. That zodiac is then grabbed with a, a large crane, where they actually crane and pull you out of the water uh, about 50 feet and then swing you over to the island. Um, so it's it's quite an experience, uh, you know, to be dealing with this at you know six in the morning, uh, and then they drop you down and, and you're good to go. The islands are effectively in the middle of the shipping lanes. Uh, there's, there's three major lanes uh, from the north uh, going east and west and from the south into the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's, uh, the island has existed as a, as a lighthouse uh, since 1855. And the, the peak of the island is about 370 feet. So it's not a very large island, but it is a, it's a great landmark to know if you're going towards uh, you know, uh, San Francisco or, or towards Hawaii, hopefully going the right direction. You can actually see the top ha half of the lighthouse um, from San Francisco on a clear day, which is uh, very rare. Um, and the Fresnel lens has actually uh, been preserved, so you can actually see the original lighthouse uh, over in the uh, San Francisco Maritime Museum near Fisherman's Wharf. Um, you can see a couple pictures here of sort of the original uh, design of the lighthouse uh, by the Coast Guard, who continues to maintain it today. It's, of course, been replaced with sort of modern technology, solar rays, uh, newer lights, that sort of thing. So why do we get involved in this? Um, the island is, is communication is extremely critical uh, to the organization there. Um, historically, they've had some pretty low-tech approaches to data, and even voice has been very challenging for them. Um, 
The only way that cell phones work uh, is from the lighthouse. You have to climb all the way to the top. It's about a 20-minute walk uh, if you're out of shape. And once you get to the top of the island, uh, then you've got to find signal, and it turns out that only the, the legacy IDAN or, or Nextel now Sprint uh, technology works up there. None of the GSM works, and as you know, AMPS is, uh, no longer exist. Uh, they've had some uh, very uh, legacy, actually pre a 11 b data, it's an error in the slides there, um, that's somewhat worked but had some major problems. We got involved because the last point there is uh, one of the local museums, the California Academy of Science, wanted to install uh, a webcam. And because of that requirement, they needed to have sort of modern bandwidth capability. The other big change that's uh, gone through a huge transition on the island is their data collection and analysis. So the organization that runs the island, the PRBO, or Point Reyes Bird Observatory, they're moving a lot of their systems into the digital domain. Uh, so since about, I guess, the 1940s, they've been uh, doing a daily diary every single day, and that's in paper version. So they're, they're moving that online. Uh, and data analysis is taken extremely seriously there. So every, every scientist and every person on the island carries a small uh, moleskin or some sort of small notebook with them, and they write down every single uh, animal, every single boat, every single interaction they have uh, with wildlife. The design criteria uh, effectively falls down in, into three main categories. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tim here in a second. The big one is really uh, the, the price and the economics of the solution. Uh, as all the parties involved are not commercial organizations, we have uh, government organization, nonprofit organizations, uh, a museum, none of them are really flush with cash. So it was important to have something that was affordable, uh, that they could deploy uh, in a timely manner and that could deal with the weatherproof requirements there. Um, they, they have sort of a running joke that there's sort of the Farallon effect out there where anytime you bring any gear out there, uh, even if it's, you know, uh, rated to deal with outdoor, uh, you know, salt and temperature and other environmentals, it tends to degrade and not last very long out there, particularly since you get a lot of salt water um, and you get a lot of interaction with, uh, with dew, uh, with rain, um, pretty much every single day. Poop, even more important. Uh, there's lots of bird poop there because that's their island, not really ours. Um, another one is, is reliability. So the island is staffed with generally about four to five uh, scientists in rotation. And their expertise is not an IP or an RF. So we wanted a solution where they're able to debug uh, what's going on and uh, something that makes it effective for them to be able to remotely manage the solution and also debug problems in an easy way. So things like an LED that shows status of the link, um, cables that are clearly labeled, that sort of stuff that makes the diagnostics easier was, was really important to this process. Second major point we looked at was, was the site survey. Was this even possible to upgrade the link? Um, the nice thing is, from an obstruction standpoint, the only really problem we had was air. There weren't any buildings in the way. We could see them from multiple points in San Francisco. The next step in terms of a site survey is where on the mainland could we approach to connect to the island. That was fairly tricky because we needed to find a location that had lots of bandwidth. And we found a great partner, and that was uh, the city and county of San Francisco. They have a number of sites that they use for their own communication needs. And one of them that happened to sort of fall upon us is up in Twin Peaks. So if you see the, uh, the mountain effectively before Sutro Tower, there's two smaller towers. You can drive up there as a, as a tourist or a guest. Uh, that's the, uh, the Twin Peaks site that's run by the city, where we installed our wireless gear that shoots out to the Farallons. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the modeling and dive into the, the RF needs uh, of this uh, design. Yes. Okay. Uh, the other criteria that we also had to deal with is the fact that since they generate their own power there, they have about, uh, they have like four 15 kilowatt generators and such. They really don't want to run diesel all the time out there. Uh, they have about six kilowatts worth of uh, solar cells. So we were kind of limited to about 100 watts of power that we can put on the island, um, which includes 
a flash media encoder server to, for the uh, for the camera, the camera itself, the the radios, and a switch and such, as well as a router. So we had to be very careful about that. Um, solutions that we had, which Matt's going to talk about in a second, are things like using Socrus, a little embedded processor for a router running OpenBSD, um, and uh, and the the radios, which are ubiquity radios, which take about three to five watts worth of power and such. The, we also had very limited mounting space on the island. We could not mount the antennas themselves onto the lighthouse, where the Coast Guard would say, fine, you own it now. And uh, the PBR, PRBO and, and uh, Fish and Wildlife did not want to deal with that. Uh, as Matt said, we had pretty good luck with, um, with the city of San Francisco. They were very kind in letting us be able to connect to that. And they also gave us uh, a gigabit worth of fiber or, or, or a VLAN effectively between that site and back to 200 Paul, where Inner Archive is supplying the bandwidth. Um, Matt also mentioned there's no obstructions, so that was not a, as much of a problem. We did have to do a little bit of sniffing up on the San Francisco end, uh, RF wise, to be able to make sure that uh, we don't have um, other devices on the same frequencies we wanted to operate on. Typically, when you do a long-distance sort of modeling, you're going to have to do some sort of software design or some, some sort of modeling before you just want to go out and start throwing stuff up there because likely you're going to invest, you know, quite a bit of gear and then find out that this isn't going to work. There's various levels of software that you can get. Uh, it's usually in the hundreds of thousands all the way down to free. Uh, I usually say you get what you pay for, but there's some interesting product out there that you may want to check out. Uh, the more expensive side, there's a company called EDX, which is doing a really nice product. Um, so if you really have to get serious and there's going to be a lot of money invested into this thing, you may want to look at that. Um, there's a, another product called PathLoss, which does path profiles, which I'll talk about in a second. A little less expensive. And then there's a product out there called Radio Mobile that's made in Canada uh, that's free that a lot of uh, uh, community wireless folks are using out there. Um, so if you just Google Radio Mobile, you'll find it there. It's amazing what it actually does and what it does some really nice TIREM and propagation modeling and such. Uh, again, more cash, more accurate. So again, we get into some better modeling, you get some better uptime prediction and such for the, the more expensive packages. The things you have to model are typically what's called link budget, path profile, atmospherics modeling, and interference and such. Link budget, which we'll go into here in a second, which has to do is are you going to have enough signal on the other end to be able to make it? The path profile is to look at obstructions, length of the path and such. Atmospheric modeling is try to predict the uptime depending on, like, for instance, rain fade and such. And then <clears throat> interference to others in the path uh, uh, is going to be something like, is the antenna that I'm going to pick make sure that it's going to not necessarily pick up signals from uh, adjacent uh, transmitters and such. So uh, you can use, again, software for that kind of stuff. Link budget. Um, and the fact that the, the how you add up a link budget is you're going to have gain and you're going to have loss. Gain is going to be things like you're going to have transmitters and receive amplifiers. You're going to have uh, antenna gain. Loss is things like the path loss, the actual signal loss between the, between the receive and the transmit antennas, which is called free space loss. I'm skipping around here. I apologize. Transmission line loss, uh, you're going to have, for instance, LMR400, which seems to be the standard for a lot of uh, community wireless folks, uh, has about a dB and a half of loss per meter at 5.8 kilo, uh, gigahertz. So that's something that you have to consider as well when you add this all up. This is kind of a quick schematic uh, of what, where the gain and the loss is on these sort of things. I'm going to rush through here because I know we have about 10 minutes left. Um, Here's sort of an example of what signal level looks like when you go through the link from the transmitter side. <clears throat> you're going to lose a little bit of the connectors and such. You're going to gain a lot from the antenna. You're going to lose a lot in the free space, gain a little bit back on the receive antenna, lose a little bit on the, on the coax, and then hopefully that receive uh, signal is enough that you can be able to decode that signal. Let's see here. This is how you add it up. Uh, there's a little program that I kind of wrote, it's a little Excel spreadsheet, or you can actually, it's, I have a Perl script as well that you can go to my site at lns.com, um, and it just basically shows how you can sort of calculate this. And this is very rudimentary. It's a good idea just sort of give you a, a, a course idea if you're going to have enough signal on the other end. We actually found that 
in, in cranking in the numbers, you know, this frequency, how much transmitter output I'm going to have, the estimated uh, antenna gain and loss and things like that, that the numbers that I got up, uh, I got at the end, actually showed up to be what we actually uh, got in real life. So what you're shooting for is that green number at the bottom there, which is called feigned margin. And that's the amount of signal above what the receiver needs to be able to decode it. And the reason you need a little bit of fade margin, and in, in longer distance you actually need a lot of fade margin, is because the atmospherics are going to bounce that signal quite a bit up and down depending on, you know, weather conditions and such. So, let's see. Um, path loss is something you're going to have to sort of like calculate and model as well. Um, path loss usually have three major sort of factors to this. One is refraction, and that's things like thermal ducting, uh, marine evaporation boundary layer, and these are, are terms that basically mean that the signal will get bent as it goes through the air. And depending on the, sort of the thickness of the air, temperature, boundary layers, things like that, the signal may not get to the other end because it's actually going to go auger into the water or, or actually even shoot over the island depending on how much the signal gets bent. Again, the longer the path and the more adverse the conditions, like going over oceans and things like that, the more likely these things are going to affect you. The way that you sort of solve these is either putting up multiple antennas to try to capture the signal on a vertical level, or even power through it by putting, like, lots of power on either end. Uh, atmospheric attenuation is usually like rain or snow. At these frequencies, at, at the license frequency is 2.4 or 5.8, it doesn't have that much effect, um, but things like trees and such, uh, a lot of people will, will design a path so that they'll, they'll, they'll put up a path in the wintertime when the trees don't have any leaves in it, and then all of a sudden the path doesn't work when the trees actually have leaves because they're actually containing water in those leaves, and they'll actually attenuate. The other issue is that you're going to run into is Fresnel zone attenuation. I'm going to show some graphics on that and show you what, that, what that's all about. Atmospheric calculations where we talk about rain fade and things like that, you can actually do that. That's, that's based on a lot of modeling that AT&T did in the 50s and such for their long distance uh, microwave links. For, uh, and they went out, looked at the atmosphere, you know, weather conditions, things like that, tried to predict and try to model this. And this, this has been actually uh, modeled, computerized modeled at this point. And a lot of companies like Path Loss and such will have this built into their software. You won't find this in Radio Mobile, but you will find this in the more expensive software. So we did the modeling on this. We figured there was actually going to be about a 99.8% uptime with uh, the path that we have at this point. In fact, it's actually a little less, and, and I'm going to go into reasons why for that. Uh, it has to do with marine boundary layer, but we'll talk about that in a second. Um, Fresnel zone is rather critical. Uh, Fresnel zone is a area that you have to sort of protect around the beam. It gets fatter in the middle, as you can see from this graphic, and it gets skinnier on the ends. Uh, the first Fresnel zone is the uh, between the, which is shown by that B, which is the center to that kind of the outside line, uh, is the critical area. You make, have to make sure the objects are not in there. Um, that will actually cause what's called knife edge diffraction, or it could cause multipath to bounce back into the receive antenna and put signals out of phase as such. Um, the same software that I did with the path calculations uh, that's up at LNS.com will actually show you the Fresnel, Fresnel zone calculation. So if you have something that looks like it may be cutting into it, you can, you can go through here and figure out what your Fresnel zone radius is and see if it's going to be a problem for that obstruction. Path profiles are typically uh, done, and this is usually using the, um, the standard shuttle radar image data that's out there, you can get stuff that's usually accurate within about 3 to 10 meters and such in elevation data. Uh, so what we do is we stick Latin lawn into these things, we tell it the frequency and such, and it comes up with this really nice sort of like earth profile. The, uh, the red line is obviously the center of the microwave, the, the blue line is the Fresnel zone that we have to make sure that we clear. That yellow line at the bottom, which sort of bulges up, that's the earth curve, curve to the earth. And then we had to worry about this little bump on the, on the far right-hand side. That's actually the San Francisco end. There's a little, uh, there was a hill that we may have been obstructed by. And the only way to sort of like 
make sure that that doesn't uh, cause the problems, we actually have to go out there and do what's called a site survey and see if there's not a house or a building that's going to be cutting into that that sits on top of that. Fortunately, it was kind of like a forest and such on that top, so it wasn't anything that was cutting into us. Um, there's obviously antenna and transmission line selection that we have to worry about. Uh, I'm going to run through this a little bit again. Um, what type of connector? What type of coax? And in the case of, for instance, uh, where we're running into hospital, uh, hostile environments with seawater and such, we have to make sure that we're not using stuff that's going to degrade pretty quickly. We're going to have to use stuff that uh, is going to last for a couple years and such. So, for instance, we're going to put like a radome, which is basically a covering on the front of the antenna to protect the antenna feed and such. Um, there's electrical considerations that we have to deal with on the antenna selection. In other words, what's the operating frequency? How much gain is required to make the signal to get to the other end? Preferred radiation pattern. And the radiation pattern is critical, again, to try to minimize the amount of signal that we may be getting off the side so we don't have interference or we're not necessarily blasting somebody else. We have to be careful about that. Uh, what's the power cap capability antenna? If we're going to be using a 100 watt transmitter, we want to make sure the antenna doesn't melt off. Polarization is, is, a, is a concern um, due to the fact that polarization is used to prevent multipath. So, for instance, if you're running over a large flat surface like water, which is a horizontal surface, you want to consider using an antenna that's vertically polarized because any of the uh, reflections are going to be coming back off the water or horizontally polarized. If I use a vertical polarized antenna, I'm going to be ignoring that multipath. It's going to be attenuating that. So if I was trying to deploy in downtown San Francisco where they had a large, a lot of uh, buildings that are vertical, I'm going to use a horizontal polarization. You can also, there's a concept called circular polarization, which actually solves a lot of those as well. But again, we're not going to run into that too much right now. Um, some antennas can support dual polarities. And for instance, in the antennas we deployed uh, for the 5.8 gig link, we used um, uh, some rockets which have two antennas on it, which basically has two. It's using MIMO, so it has two chains on it. We put one antenna output on the vertical and one antenna on the, on the horizontal. Uh, Matt, the schematic. Switch here. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's look at some uh, some pretty busy anomnographal here. Um, so the cloud is obviously uh, the, the intertubes there from an archive. Uh, the city has a, a large uh, fiber network uh, with various rings, and so this shows a very encapsulated view of that. We actually run two links out to the island, uh, both 2.4 and 5.8. Uh, this is uh, some newer gear that uh, is actually H11 uh, N. We'll talk about that uh, on a few slides here. On the island is kind of interesting. So we've we've actually gone through I think about three or four uh, iterations on the network on the island, uh, based on different models of reliability on the links and what the best mechanism is to fail over. Uh, we're trying to minimize dirty tricks like two or three layers of nap, that sort of thing. So on the island there, you've got a pretty standard uh, Cisco switch um, that then goes into a Socrus board. It's a small x86 board, as Tim mentioned. And then to get the actual connection from the lighthouse on the top of the island down uh, into uh, the buildings that are uh, staffed there, uh, we have a, a number of uh, fiber connections. So there's uh, the antenna going back towards San Francisco. We've got uh, uh, a number of uh, fiber pairs that go to the uh, power or generation room, and then over into the uh, living quarters. Uh, the picture that you see uh, on the top left there is the antennas that uh, Tim was talking about as, he, as, a, as a radome or a plastic uh, protector in the front. We use minimal amounts of coax, so it's, it's nothing longer than about three or four feet of, of coax. And that goes into uh, these uh, small embedded boards and it's powered by power ethernet. The idea here is to minimize the amount of coax as much as possible for a variety of reasons. One of the big ones is the, the loss of signal, as Tim was talking about, and also um, coax is very difficult to, to handle. It's uh, not something like RJ45 where you can crimp in, in you know, 30 seconds blindfolded. LMR and uh, Radiax and uh, some of the Andrew cables, extremely difficult to prepare 
And so we wanted to have cables that were short where they wouldn't get uh, taught, and uh, rather they would get taught and they wouldn't get uh, moved by personnel in the lighthouse. So here's a, a picture of some of the equipment. Uh, this is probably the third or fourth uh, box we put up there. Unfortunately, due to the logistics of the island, we generally get less than 12 hours notice when there's going to be a boat ride out there. So this is my third backup uh, weatherproof case. This is a small fiberglass case made by a company called Stalin. It's generally used for enclosures and, and factory lines, that sort of thing. And this was my example case that I used for presentation, so that's why you can see the clear window. It's not really designed to go out there, but we did it anyways. Um, you can see there's, there's two radios in there. The small bullet one uh, is the 2.4 gigahertz radio, and then the small rectangle one in the back is uh, the rocket radio, uh, which is a 5.8 gigahertz. We then use um, outdoor ethernet and a number of weatherproof connectors between the box to the outside world. Inside uh, is pretty messy. Again, when you're going to the island, there's very minimal amounts of notice to get there. Um, as you saw from the pictures, it's, it's at least an hour and a half process to get off the boat, unload all the equipment, get up to the top of the lighthouse. So generally, on average, we've gotten three hours of a window, and that's a complete 12-hour day. So we get about three hours of actual time to do work. So this is not very pretty. This is a fairly dirty, but what you can see is there's uh, two media converters up at the top there. Uh, again, as Tim mentioned, power is a concern, so these are just 100 megabit, uh, you know, trend net specials, nothing fancy, just low power. The Cisco switch, uh, I think it's a 2950, 12-port um, Socrus board, uh, and then a number of wall warts and power strips. That then, again, comes down into the, the staff house, and that's a little bit more cleaner. Again, you see the media converters there. Uh, a small energy efficient switch. Uh, they have a, a VoIP ATA adapter and then Wi-Fi uh, within the, uh, the living quarters there. So a little more detail about the kit. Uh, that's what they call it from uh, Europe. They call these things kits. I'm not sure why. But basically the kit is comprised of the two radios that we talked about. Really the nice thing about the Ubiquiti gear is that it's a standard Linux image that's accessible to you. So unlike Microchick and other vendors that are based off of Linux and completely hide that fact, the nice thing about the Ubiquiti gear is you can get a shell on it, you can add additional packages, you can tweak it. If you think you've got a better uh, Atheros driver, you can deploy it on there. So they're really nice uh, equipment and it's extremely affordable. You're looking at under $100 per radio. Uh, the standard is, is M connector for most of these radios. Uh, on the 5.8, they actually, since it's a dual polarized, we have two different uh, uh, polarities on a single antenna. We actually use two different antenna connectors on the radio. As mentioned, these are H11N based. Uh, this is a pre-standard, so it works really good with other Ubiquiti gear and doesn't really interoperate with other H11N gear, such as uh, Cisco. One of the things that will definitely bite you on this uh, in the wireless space versus uh, VoIP phones is the PoE is never really standardized. Um, we've seen uh, the voltages vary. You know, I've seen 5 volts, 12 volts, 24, 48. The pairs flipped. Some of them are passive. Some of them are pre-standard. Uh, some of them actually follow the standard. So it's very important to make sure you've got the proper PoE so you don't blow out your equipment and have to start the process all over again. Um, on the antennas, Pacific Wireless is another great vendor, very affordable antennas. Uh, historically, these were, you know, thousands of dollars. This is sub-500, very cheap. The embedded board, everyone's heard of Socrus boards. They've been around for a long time. Part of the reason we decided to pick a Socrus board is it's a known quantity. They work well. They don't seem to break. And we can just bring out a new CF card. We're good to go. And the switch, just again, a standard switch. The idea there is in our latest... Uh, iteration of the network, we use spanning tree as our failover mechanism. On the actual uh, embedded board, uh, we're, using, we're using OpenBSD. Um, we're not really into religious wars. We don't think uh, Canada's great or anything like that, but it just worked out really well, and it was very simple and easy to use. There's a great script uh, called Flash RD that effectively strips down the OS and then gives you two aliases, RW and RO, so read, write, 
and uh, read only. So this allows the system to boot up uh, with a standard init script, no XML, no web interface. It's standard stock OpenBSD. You can use package management. It's just like a normal system, but the idea is that it focuses on not uh, writing out to the flash. A lot of flash um, doesn't emulate uh, FAT compatibility. It doesn't emulate file system compatibility so well, so bad blocks or sectors effectively happen and your flash can die. And so it's very important to minimize writes to the system. A uh, really great other utility is a DHCP uh, dump. This is in uh, FreeBSD ports, but works fine on, on Linux and uh, other Unix-based systems. Really great way to see the various DHCP vendor tags that devices are probing out to their DHCP request. And my personal favorite is uh, ngrep. It's very similar to TCP dump, but you can actually see the ASCII output. It has a really nice support for seeing actual byline output. So you can see the proper formatting of what the web browser is sending out. This was useful to us because there were a number of websites that they could not reach, and we were trying to debug exactly what was happening. We thought it might have been a browser problem or a plug-in problem, and this allowed us to see the traffic very easily. Um, Tim's going to talk about uh, the Ubiquiti H11N uh, support. I'll make it real quick because I know we're already out of time here. Um, some of the problems we ran into on the long distance is the fact that the single level was jumping up and down considerably on this thing, um, and we were not able to negotiate both ends very easily. Uh, so these are kind of like a set of, uh, of conditions you may want to start with if you're doing long distance wireless uh, with the uh, ubiquity radios. Disable the AirMax, which is their proprietary sort of polling, polling protocol. It's mainly used for point to multipoint connections. Disable auto negotiation because what happens is every time you, you know, a single level changes, it tries to auto negotiate for a higher speed. Uh, and that basically, if something bounces like several times a second, you're never going to get a link up. Use the smallest channel width as possible. That satisfies the bandwidth requirements. On the long distance links that have interference, you avoid any modulation schemes that have an amplitude component to it, like QAM. Try to use something like uh, uh, BSFK, uh, which just has an FM comp component to it, and you, you gain the uh, capture effect that you have with typically with FM. Uh, also set the distance directives to about 30% more, because apparently it is a, uh, it's not quite accurate in the ubiquity thing. If you know you have a 50 kilometer link, you need, you need to add it, actually tune it to like about 60 kilometers or so. So some of the... <laughs> So some of the, uh, the lessons that we really learned on the, uh, the IP side is uh, PF has a method called scrub, uh, which is sec is effectively does things like uh, TCP uh, packet reassembly and the usual sorts of uh, security that you would want to apply in your network. Uh, this actually can create sort of an asymmetric routing situation, and so we actually had a number of problems where they weren't able to load Facebook, but they could load Twitter or something like that. And so uh, this was uh, debugged and looked very much like a path MTU problem, so it's important that you you know, all the different rules that are in your, your firewall set. It's pretty obvious. A uh, big one is actually have techies buy um, the cabling. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we got this outdoor Ethernet cable, and it would not fit in any of the jacks. I actually took, uh, I think, seven different brands of RJ45 jacks to find one that would actually fit this cable. Uh, it's also very sticky, so you're, you're out there in the weather trying to crimp this cable that's, that's really sticky, and it's a huge mess. Um, it's very dirty out there, so, you know, your, your clothes are going to be thrown away. Uh, tools disappear, and as I mentioned earlier, there's just never enough time when you're in these remote locations. Some of the future reductions that we'd like to look at is potentially avoiding the unlicensed bands. That's tricky in this situation because they just don't have the funding to buy a lot of the so-called carrier class radios. The next big step is upgrading the uh, webcam so that it's actually a more modern resolution. Right now it's effectively uh, 720 or standard def resolution. Uh, more bandwidth would be great, so we're looking at running links from different uh, facilities uh, on the mainland, potentially other sites in San Francisco, even north in Marin. Uh, another great thing we'd, we'd love to do is put a, an on-island uh, sort of visual display for the scientist to be able to debug when there's network problems. That's it. Questions? Thanks. I don't know if you could see the bird. We, we supplied tin hats to the uh, birds uh, there, so you can see that. <laughs> Uh, Jay Hannigan with Impulse. 
you mentioned that you used uh, both horizontal and vertical polarization on your 5.8 link simultaneously. Is that for diversity, or is it for additional bandwidth, or or what's the uh, what's the rationale behind having both the vertical and horizontal polarization on that radio? Um, since there's two chains on the 5.8 radios, uh, we wanted to ex exploit that. So the only way to do that with, with doing with one antenna is having the split between horizontal and vertical polarizations. Uh, this just gives us a little bit more reliability, gives us about another 3 dB worth of signal or fade margin on it, and actually more speed, too, as Thank well. You. Same frequency? Yeah, it's, it's the exact same frequency, yeah. Anton Capella, Five Nines Data. Cool slides, like wireless, like that stuff. Um, I do have a question. What was the final power draw? What was the total budget? You said you had 100 watts to work with, but what did you get it down to, or what did it end up at? I think it's probably around 50 watts. Probably the Cisco switch takes up most of it. Uh, the radios are probably like 2 to 3 watts, something like that. The Soakers board is like 5 watts, yeah, something low. like that. We know we didn't go over budget because we didn't trip any breakers. So. <laughs> uh, so. We don't carry the water meter around like you, Tony. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's all right. And uh, the other question I was going to ask you was, um, are there any other systems that aren't like like eleven based that are this low power, like the um, you know synchronous quote unquote TDM you know legacy systems that we we see out there for people doing you know end by T one that kind of stuff, you know, point to point license radios that kind of thing. Right. Any of that stuff appropriate at, at this point? It, it would be if we could afford it. Uh, Dragon Wave makes some really nice carrier class radios out there that that uh, we could actually even push more bandwidth with. But again, we're, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. And uh, the last point, maybe I did miss it, but what was the final performance figure like? What were you guys seeing for transport, uh, delay, all that kind of stuff? Um, we could actually probably do what's called MCS, you know, whatever, 16, or we could probably do the fastest rate, but I've locked it down to uh, MCS 8, which I think is like 12 megabits or so on the thing. And then the latency, I'm not sure what the latency is. It's, it's relatively low. low. So they're happy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they're they're in fact uh, they they've been watching the World Cup out there. They're you know this is the first time that they've been able to get video, uh, Hulu, all those sort of things, as well as having a voice line, having a real telephone out there as opposed to having to use you know two way radios and such. So they're they're right up there with the 20th century. Uh, where are they going to start peering on the island? <laughs> oh yeah, we're putting an IX out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as you could expect, Tony, one of the things that's really interesting about the, the RF situation going from the mainland to the island, it's very fast from the download content. Uh, there's no congestion going that way because there's no one to compete with. There's not a lot of Linksys out in the Pacific. Uh, but going back the other way around is, is certainly challenging. So for them, it's a great experience. But getting data out has been challenging for us. So we only get a couple megabits out, but plenty coming down. I've seen up to 15 to 20 megabits coming down. Well, great. So, so is the is the bird cam uh, active? Can we, can we go I think you're being around? asked to sit down, Tony. All right. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Okay. Unfortunately, our, our, we had too many slides on this thing. I apologize. Right. We'll, we'll have to take this offline. Okay, I was just wondering. You said the uptime wasn't quite 99.8 percent. You're going to get back. Oh, I, yeah, I alluded to that. And I didn't touch on it. We're, we're running into what's called. This, this is a critical thing, and we'll make this the last one. We're running into what's called marine evaporation boundary layer. And what happens is, most of the days in San Francisco, it's usually windy. There's fog, things like that. On those. About a week out of the year, we'll get absolutely still air, and we'll have a really nice sunny day. And what that means is we'll have really sort of cold air above the ocean, but right above the ocean for like about a you know 30 meters or something like that, you'll have a whole bunch of uh, evaporation coming off the ocean and such. So you have this sort of boundary between the two, and they actually will bend the signal down. And so those days, we don't actually have connection to the island. Uh, I was going across the Golden Gate Bridge, and I looked over to the right, and I could see the islands, and I'd see a mirror image of the island right underneath it. And I could say, ah, it's one of those days that we're not going to get a signal out there. I called them up, and, or I called up the academy, and I said, are you getting the, uh, the camera? They said, no. And I said, I can see it, because optically, it's, it's actually bending the signal out there. Yeah, so. and uh, the follow-up on that point, we actually graphed signal and weather, and there's a really nice correlation between them. <laughs>